Omar, thank you very much for joining us today on TV9 Network. I want to begin by asking you about the political climate in Jammu and Kashmir. As a former chief minister, as someone who comes from a historic family uh, of Abdullahs in Jammu and Kashmir, what is the political climate like? And if I may add, what is the security situation like in Jammu and Kashmir at present? Uh, Jammu and Kashmir is currently going through its longest spell of central rule. And uh, there is no end in sight. The goalposts keep being shifted. Uh, one moment uh, the Union Home Minister comes, he speaks, gives an indication uh, that elections uh, are uh, to be expected soon. Nobody is begging for an election. People here want one, but they won't beg for one. We have too much pride. Uh, what we would like uh, is some clarity, a bit of honesty. You don't want to have elections, don't have them. We'll manage without them. Uh, but if you intend to have them, then I think like other states, uh, they know uh, the schedule under which they have to work. I think that's the least the people of Jammu and Kashmir can expect. Be honest with us. Tell us when to expect an election. Now, as far as the security situation is concerned, look, Jammu and Kashmir is an unsettled place. Uh, you have good days, you have bad days. Uh, there are days on which uh, the security forces uh, have successes. There are days on which uh, the militants are able to target innocent civilians, uh, both belonging to the majority community as well as from the minority communities. Full peace, contrary to what was promised uh, on the 5th of August uh, 2019, has not been restored to Jammu and Kashmir. Uh, whether it will be or not is something that is, is open to discussion. Uh, there is a semblance of calm as far as law and order is concerned. Uh, it would be interesting to analyze the reasons for that. I think you and I would probably vehemently disagree uh, as to why that is the case. But let's accept that uh, the sort of mass protests that you've seen on the streets in Jammu and Kashmir, you don't see these days. Uh, I hope that this is a real calm, not an artificial one, because if it's real, then it's long lasting. Uh, then it's something that we can, we can look forward to uh, for the foreseeable future. If it's artificial, then uh, there's no telling when this can end. You mentioned Union Home Minister Amit Shah. He was in Baramulla to address a political rally and he mentioned that the situation is much better than before. And uh, he also talked about post Article 370, it is a Naya Kashmir. So is it a Naya Kashmir that we are talking about post Article 370? Do you believe so? Look, first and foremost, let's agree to disagree on the numbers. Uh, you may have seen 30 to 40,000. I saw Generously, I'll go up to 15, otherwise 10 to 12. Uh, a lot of those people were not BJP supporters. Uh, they were actually Pahadis who hoped uh, that the Home Minister was going to announce their reservation in that rally. They went back disappointed. Uh, so let's not confuse that rally uh, for some great outpouring of support for the BJP. But it's a good thing the Home Minister came. It's a good thing he had a big rally. Uh, because the next time uh, somebody like my party or Mehbooba's party or some of the other parties that the BJP doesn't like very much want to have a big rally, the administration had better not put a spoke in the works. If it's good for the Home Minister, it's good for us. We have every right to host a rally as well. And we'll also look forward uh, to going to South Kashmir, to Baramulla, to Kupwara, to places like that. We'll also bring out our cadre and we'll make sure uh, that the administration is supportive of our rally as well. Uh, we don't want them to bring people uh, the way they do for government rallies. We'll arrange our own people. Uh, but they'll have to make sure uh, that they give us a level playing field. Now, as far as uh, Naya Jammu and Kashmir is concerned, yes, it's new. But not all new things are good. Uh, you can have new things uh, that are not for the better. Uh, so I don't know how uh, they can claim Jammu and Kashmir has improved because we don't see much improvement. Uh, again, with the caveat that I gave you right in the beginning that yes, I do accept that uh, street protests are not seen the way they were in the past. But other than that, whichever index you want to check in terms of new recruitment into militancy, it's still going on. In fact, if anything, uh, from time to time, those numbers go up. Attacks against minorities, which was definitely a thing of the past, is a rebirth. That's part of your Naya Jammu and Kashmir. The way in which uh, Kashmiri pundits have been targeted, uh, Highly unfortunate, something that in between we had stopped seeing. 
we now see, unfortunately, with more regularity than we would have liked. Uh, so the security environment is not something that gives us much comfort. Well, uh, you also mentioned, interestingly, the Pahadi community. And that brings me to my next question. There's been a general perception in New Delhi with the media and the political parties that in Jammu and Kashmir, the Pahadis, the Gujars and the Bakarwals have been neglected, have been isolated and ignored by the ruling governments, ruling successive governments. Do you believe so? And how would you defend that charge? Ignored how? Please look in the last assembly in which I was uh, in the opposition. How many Gujar uh, MLAs there were? Can you point out a single government to me that has not had Gujar and Pahadi ministers at the senior most level in that government? I'm, I'm, I won't talk for any other party. Look at the National Conference government. You show me a government of the National Conference that has not had meaningful senior representation of Pahadis and Gujars. Did we not nominate people uh, to the Legislative Council? The National Conference put a Muslim Gujar in Parliament, in the Lok Sabha. We didn't nominate him to the Rajya Sabha. We helped Chaudhary Talib win a Lok Sabha election. That's what we did. So, look, talk is cheap. Why now? You've had all these years to do it. Why now suddenly when an election is around the corner do you wake up to all these things? You know, in 2019, uh, there was a very interesting term that was used against you, uh, and that was Gupkar Gang by the Union Home Minister. No, that didn't come from them. That came from you guys. You people did this. You loved Omar, it. Omar, you know that's not true. Let's be honest. It was the BJP. I have only asked questions on Gupkar Gang. I'll, I'll, I'll produce your, your social media. Uh, I've got it all. But what what the, the stuff you've had to say, look, don't, don't just put it but on the BJP. You people were very happy to echo it. In fact, if anything, you went 10 steps further. Uma, if you're done, can I complete my question? How do you react to such an accusation coming in against you, particularly against the Abdullahs and the Muftis? We are the biggest opposition to the BJP here. We are the party that will stop them doing what they want to do, which is to destroy what Jammu and Kashmir stands for. We are in their way. We don't roll over and play dead. We didn't stand up and clap when they did what they did on the 5th August 2019. Nor did we take law into our own hands. We didn't oblige them by giving a call for protests on the street. We didn't oblige them by trying to spoil the environment in Jammu and Kashmir. We said whatever we will do, we will do peacefully. Whatever we will do, we will do constitutionally, we will do legally. That's what we're doing. They don't like that. They don't, want, they don't want to be asked questions. They don't want a, a, a reply. I mean, it's our job to, to put the facts out. Unfortunately, when we put the facts out, they don't like it. The Home Minister asked us for an account of, of what we did in power. We gave an account, an abridged account, but our abridged account covered five pages. They were very uncomfortable. They've had, they've had their entire uh, IT cell uh, trying to figure out how to attack us. Facts make them un uncomfortable and we deal with facts. But there have also been charges directly at your family uh, by the Home Minister, by the Union Home Minister who has uh, spoken on several occasions um, and your father, uh, Mr. Farooq Abdullah, has had notices by the Enforcement Directorate and he has been summoned continuously. How would you defend that charge? Look, politics is what it is. Uh, I don't think uh, anyone has forgotten how the BJP itself has been accused of all sorts of things in the past. When they're not proven, that's the end of it. It's the same here. And if my father was uh, on his own in this, the only politician to face this, uh, it would be uh, something else entirely. There is no opposition politician uh, who is not on the receiving end uh, of such charges uh, and, and this sort of propaganda. It's something that uh, the politics of India uh, we've, we've come to accept. Uh, and as I said, uh, when he gets his day in court, uh, he will prove his innocence. There's also been continuous attack by the BJP and, uh, you know, several of its top leaders against uh, the successive governments, particularly two families of Kupkar Road, uh, the Muftis and the Abdullahs. Why hasn't there been then a non-Mufti or a non-Abdullah as the Chief Minister of JNK in the last several decades? Why hasn't there been a woman President of the BJP. 50% of the population of India are women. The Prime Minister 
and all the senior functionaries of the BJP talk so much about women empowerment. Why has there never been a woman leader of the BJP or the RSS? If they are such great Democrats, why hasn't 50% of the population found representation at that level in the BJP or the RSS? Look, we can all trade charges. The fact of the matter is that we are a democratic political party. We fight elections. We are not selected from Nagpur or anywhere else. We submit to uh, the guidelines and the directives of the Election Commission of India. Party has membership, membership has elections, elections elect a leader. Up until now, they have been comfortable electing a member of the Abdullah family. There's no saying that that will continue uh, forever. Uh, tomorrow, uh, they're well within their powers to elect a woman who doesn't belong uh, to the Abdullah family. And I hope they do that one day. Uh, I wouldn't come in the way of that. I don't, I don't see why you people have a problem with a lineage. And why just in politics? Why don't you have a problem with lineage when it's in other fields? Why don't you have a problem with lineage when it's in business? You don't seem to have a problem when the big industrial families of this country hand over their businesses worth hundreds and thousands of crores to their children. Do we know whether they're competent to handle those businesses or not? No, we don't. But you don't ask the question. But you were in power uh, with the BJP. You were yourself a minister in the Ministry of External Affairs. Uh, did you have a problem with them at that particular time? Did you ask these questions to them at that time? I doubt whether you will find a man on the streets in Jammu and Kashmir today will have a problem with Vajpayee Saab. Look at his legacy. The Sirnagar Muzaffarabad Road. Kashmiriyat, Jamuriyat, Insaniyat. Extending a hand of peace. Ke hum dost badal sakte, hum palosi nahi badal sakte. I have no problem with that. I never had a problem working with Vajpayee Saab. I've never been apologetic. As much as you people have tried to make it appear as if I con committed some cardinal sin, I have never been apologetic about my term in office with Vajpayee Saab. Given a chance, I would do the same thing again. I'm proud of the work I did with him. I, I believe that he left a lasting legacy. It's a pity that his own party has distanced itself from the legacy of Vajpayee Saab. They have disowned his legacy, not me. I would love to keep his legacy alive. Well, there have been several statements that have come in the past. Uh, to and fro statements. The Gupkar Alliance said that they will contest elections together. Then the NC and the PDP said they will contest elections separately. You yourself have said that I will not contest elections. Uh, what is the real situation? Are you going to contest elections as a Gupkar Alliance or separately? There have been no statements about contesting together. There have been individual opinions. Mm -hmm. And those still exist. Uh, again, I, I make the point. We are a democratic party. We encourage uh, different points of view. We want to hear points of view that are contrary to our own. Uh, that's how you arrive at a better decision. None of us, at least as far as my father and I are concerned, neither of us believe that we are born with the absolute knowledge that is required. We both understand that we are human, we, we make mistakes, we are not uh, farishtas. We want to hear opinion that is different from our own. And based on that, then the party will arrive at a decision. As far as my own personal decision is concerned, there has been no change in that. From day one, I have told you I'm not interested in contesting assembly elections. I reiterate that. There's no change. I don't want to contest assembly elections now. So are you saying that the next elections in Jammu and Kashmir will only be contested on the Article 370 plank and the return of the statehood? Or will it be like the rest of India on Roti, Kapda and Makan? Next assembly election will be contested on a number of issues, but make no mistake, sentiment will be perhaps one of the biggest issues in this election. We'll talk about development, we will have a manifesto, we will make promises. All of us want to see a developed Jammu and Kashmir, all of us want to see a prosperous Jammu and Kashmir, all of us want to see a peaceful Jammu and Kashmir, but some of us want to see a Jammu and Kashmir that has been taken away from us. And we will make that promise and we will hope that people will go along with us. And I believe they will. Because contrary to what the BJP likes to promote and what some of you like to believe, it was the parties that are opposed to, two th uh, to 5th August 2019 that produced the best results, this district board elections and the, the block elections. We were the ones that won the maximum number of seats. So in the present situation, whenever the elections happen, it doesn't seem like the elections will happen anytime soon. Are you rejecting a scenario that the national conference 
could again perhaps have an alliance in Jammu and Kashmir post elections with the BJP. On the one hand, you're saying that the Home Minister is opposed to the two families, he's opposed to Gupkar Alliance, he's opposed to everything else, and then you're suggesting that the Gupkar or the NC will tie up with the BJP. How? No, but there have been speculations and rumours all across that the NC and BJP could perhaps come together. It has happened in the past, could happen again. I don't know where the speculation is, but it doesn't, certainly hasn't reached here. Uh, and let me tell you in no uncertain terms that we are fighting this election not to come back with the need for props or stakes or support. The BJP may be doing that. We are not. We are fighting this uh, because we believe that we are right uh, and that the people will give us a resounding mandate uh, to deliver uh, justice, to deliver uh, respect, to deliver representation and to deliver uh, governance and development. And unlike uh, the, the BJP, we're not looking for allies or, or props or support. Uh, Umar, that brings me to the last question of this interview. Uh, how does Umar Abdullah or how does the National Conference see the future of Jammu and Kashmir uh, after the Article 370 abrogation? You know, right now at present, it's been the LG's administration, LG Manoj Sinha uh, has been there. Doesn't seem like elections are going to happen anytime soon. How do you yourself see the immediate future of Jammu and Kashmir? Well, it's an unsettled future. It's an uncertain future. It's not a very comfortable future. Uh, but uh, as day follows night, as spring follows winter, uh, this too shall pass. Uh, not every situation uh, lasts, for, nothing lasts forever. Everything changes. Uh, some of the changes, most of the changes we've seen now have been uh, bad ones. At some point this has to change. We have to see change for the better. Uh, I'm sure uh, we will. There's that famous saying, Snows will melt, spring will come, that's what we'll see. So we are, we are waiting for those snows to melt, for winter to run away and for spring to come and inshallah we will be at the forefront of that spring coming. Uh, you know, finally, uh, there have been continuous attacks against you, not just you, I mean your national conference uh, and your father, wherein we have seen, I have interviewed senior leaders of Apni Party and People's Conference who say that you are the elitist in Jammu and Kashmir and do not give way to other uh, you know, politicians to become chief ministers. And how do you defend this charge? I, 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 don't, I don't hide anything. I dress the way I do, I speak the way I do, I eat the way I do, I travel the way I do. I've, I've been fortunate. I, I have no hesitation in saying Allah has been very kind to me. I have been I have been born and brought up in, in a very privileged environment, which doesn't mean that I don't understand pain. I may not have lived through it, but I can still empathize with it. But I don't deny the fact that unlike most people, I've had a very privileged life. These people are no different. If I can travel to London, so can they. Why do they, why do they have to throw these barbs? Omar Abdullah, it was a pleasure having you. Thank you very much.